10 real-life horror scenes found lurking behind happy occasions. Death's rictus grinned, putrid stench, an aura of cold foreboding are almost unmistakable, but only almost. Death can also be beguiling, presenting itself as the tenderness of a parent's love or a paramour's warm embrace. Sometimes, the threat of death shrouds itself in the laughter of children or dons a mask of celebratory mirth. And when death unveils itself in such seemingly happy moments, it's all the more horrifying. 10 The Toddler on a Swing It was maternal affection personified, a mother tirelessly pushing her young son on a park swing with no end in sight, but as hours passed, the warmth of that image faded. The mother continued swinging her child into the night and into the next morning, followed by another night and another morning. Police were called in the early morning hours of May 22, 2015 to investigate. Officers arrived at 6.55 a.m. to discover Ramekia Sims pushing the lifeless body of three-year-old Jair Donnelly. She had been swinging the child for nearly 44 hours. Young Jair was very much alive when he first arrived at the park and his mother had no intention of killing him. But the 24-year-old Sims struggled with mental illness and had suffered at least one mental breakdown in the past. Instability once drove her to attack her own mother, and in another alarming incident, she leaped from a moving cab with Jair in her arms. The child's father, observing Sims' unhinged state, fought to become Jair's sole custodian. The court, however, only granted joint custody, which wasn't enough to save the helpless toddler. Days after the court's ruling, the psychologically fragile Sim snapped once more. She had been living at a motel and was struggling to balance motherhood with school and work. On May 20, at 11.30 a.m., she arrived with Jair at La Plata, Maryland's Wills Memorial Park. Over the course of two days, Jair slowly died of dehydration and exposure to the cold, while Sims swung him, utterly unaware of the lethal agony she caused, she has since been charged with manslaughter and child abuse. 9 The Slumber Party Everyone knows slumber parties are about games, gossip, and trampling all over the concept of curfew. But for Morgan Geyser and Anissa Weyer of Waukesha, Wisconsin, an overnight birthday soiree became the perfect pretext for attempted murder. On May 31, 2014, after a night of roller skating and deathless sleep, the 12-year-old's viciously stabbed peer and party guest Peyton Lutner 19 times, hoping to kill her. Their motive, Slender Man. Like many, Morgan and Anissa discovered Slender Man on the creepypasta wiki. Weyer, who suffered from a delusional disorder, and Geyser, who was schizophrenic, believed the lanky, faceless figure was real. Weyer worried that Slender Man would harm their families unless the duo sacrificed someone in his honor. So they hatched a scheme to murder Peyton Lutner at a slumber party commemorating Geyser's 12th birthday. From there, they would journey to the Slender Mansion. They revised their plot for months. Initially, they intended to stab Lutner in Geyser's room as she slept. Then they considered stabbing Lutner in a park bathroom, where the blood could escape down a floor drain. Finally, they sprang their trap during a game of hide and seek in the woods. Geyser and Weyer hesitated at first, but eventually mustered the will to spear Lutner repeatedly with knives. They then left her in the woods to die. 
Thankfully, Lutner managed to claw her way out of the woods to a sidewalk, where she was discovered by a cyclist. Despite suffering grave internal wounds, she survived. Weyer and Geyser were apprehended the same day while trying to walk to Slender Man's mansion. Despite troubling psychological evaluations that questioned their competence to stand trial, they are being tried as adults. 8. The Birthday Reunion For St. James and LaDonna Davis, their chimpanzee Mo was more of a son than a pet, the couple raised him to shower, dress, and use the commode like a human. But after more than 30 years with the Davises, Mo became too aggressive for human society, attacking a police officer and chomping off part of a woman's finger. After an emotional trial, the Davises lost custody of Mo, who was relocated to the Animal Haven Ranch Sanctuary. Despite the heartbreaking loss, the doting couple visited their hairy child often and brought him pastries on his birthday. In 2005, Mo turned 39, and in honor of the occasion, St. James and LaDonna came to the sanctuary bearing cake. But a scenario intended to be more sweet than bitter quickly took a turn for the vicious. While trying to celebrate with Mo, the couple was intercepted by two chimps named Buddy and Ollie. Buddy and Ollie stayed in the cage next to Mo's and had somehow escaped their enclosure. After briefly locking eyes with the Davises, the animals pounced. Ollie and Buddy first zeroed in on LaDonna, one of them biting off her left thumb. St. James intervened to save her, and they proceeded to mangle his face, rip out one of his testicles, and tear off one of his feet. He ended up losing most of his fingers. In the aftermath, the chimps were put down to prevent future incidents. St. James Davis required 12 surgeries and a medically induced coma to return to some semblance of health. But the nightmarish birthday bash didn't sour the pair on chimpanzees. Four years after their gruesome ordeal, the couple maintained that chimps are by and large harmless. 7. The Children in the Woods There are few sights more bucolic than children traipsing through the woods, skipping with juvenile prattle, and in the winter of 1993, a group of children exploring the woods of Chesapeake, Virginia, no doubt created a similarly blithe atmosphere. That is, until the youngsters, some as young as eight years old, took a wrong turn. Ugh, I saw the hand, one of the children exclaimed in disgust. As the freelance star newspaper gloomily described, the youngsters had discovered an open coffin with a curled hand resting above a pool of dark water. The grisly encounter with death left a lasting impression in the children's once innocent minds. They began having nightmares and became fearful of returning to those woods, which their parents bade them to avoid. What the children witnessed was the twisted handiwork of vandals who had uncovered a private but untended cemetery. Most of the boneyard's owners were either indifferent to its existence or buried in it, making upkeep and security a low priority. Seeing an opportunity for mischief, unknown rascals began digging up graves on a recurring basis. In addition to setting the stage for someone's childhood trauma, the vandalism also posed a serious danger. Some of the uncovered coffins were nestled deep in the earth, threatening severe injury for anyone who might fall inside. No clear signs existed to warn passersby when they were nearing a resting place for the deceased. Upset parents pressured local officials to tackle the problem, which had persisted for over a decade by this point. 
but with no official laws governing the handling of the private plots, efforts to clean up the cemetery floundered. 6. The Dinner Party In 2007, 42-year-old Didier Charon entertained dinner guests at his home in Verviers, eastern Belgium, despite having a wife and stepson, he hosted the festivities alone, all the while exuding a noticeable air of unease. But beyond Charon being a bit off-kilter, nothing seemed particularly amiss. One of his guests stayed behind to help tidy up the place. She dutifully tackled the dishes and took it upon herself to lug the leftovers down to the basement freezer. But it was already packed with remains of a different sort. There in Charon's freezer was a woman's icy corpse. The discovery sent Charon's guests scurrying for the safety of less murderous confines. She then called the police. Officers confirmed that the body belonged to none other than Charon's wife, 46-year-old Chantal Bernard. From there, the story only got grimmer. Tucked under Chantal was her 11-year-old son, Brian, whose presence was obscured by the narrowness of the freezer. Charon copped to stabbing Chantal to death after a heated argument but remained mum on the circumstances surrounding young Brian's demise. To some who knew Didier, none of this came as a shock. Charon had been, to put it mildly, a domestic terror who attacked his wife with vicious abandon and upped his aggression when intoxicated, which he often was. A neighbor interviewed about the relationship attested to calling police on numerous occasions to keep Charon's violent advances at bay. Chantal eventually resolved to divorce her spousal tormentor, but Charon chose to end things with brutal finality, Charon was convicted of the murders and was sentenced to life in prison. 5. The Youthful Partiers Partying teenagers often serve as a horror movie plot device. But usually the ethereal monster that springs up is an outsider. In real life, the inhuman killer is sometimes the teen who organized the get-together, as was the case with Tyler Hadley. In 2011, the 17-year-old Floridian bludgeoned his parents to death with a framing hammer for reasons that were never fully confirmed. He then hid their bodies in the master bedroom under a pile of towels, books, and other household items. Later, he hosted a party. The night was consumed by beer pong, tobacco, and general juvenile rebellion. But at some point, the young killer purportedly admitted his misdeed to a friend and showed off a bloody footprint. Macabre gossip quickly made the rounds among the guests, and someone contacted authorities before Hadley could throw a second post-mortem shindig. In 2014, the teen was condemned to life in prison without parole. Disturbingly, Hadley's case isn't the first of its kind. In 1996, Michigan teen Devon Watts was handed a life sentence for her part in the murder of 73-year-old Leonard Hewley. Watts had been cohabitating with Hewley with his trailer and, according to a recanted confession, was set to marry him. Hewley's family dismissed this claim. But she also wanted best friend Kelly Heemstra to join their trailer family. Heemstra's presence eventually bred tension, which the girls opted to resolve with a 22 rifle blast to Hewley. After wrapping Hewley's lifeless form in a blanket, the deadly duo invited friends over to view the body and chill for a while. The group chugged booze and puffed pot. Watts even had sex with a partygoer despite the fresh corpse in their midst. 
Watts would later disavow her admission in court, but jurors were unconvinced. Heemstra pleaded guilty. For the bachelor party. Many men view bachelor parties as a kind of happy funeral for their untamed masculinity before they tie the knot. In 2014, Dan Trainer of Rochester, Minnesota, decided to make his bachelor bash of sports themed road trip. The party would travel south in a massive land boat, picking up friends along the way. After catching a hockey game in Winona, Minnesota, they would ultimately drop anchor in Louisville for the Kentucky Derby. Unfortunately, their trip was derailed by a rather ghastly hiccup, a decaying cadaver had secretly tagged along for the ride. The body had been unceremoniously crammed in the RV's front compartment, which trainer and company had been instructed not to open on account of dysfunctionality. But the guests trainer picked up during their May 1 stopover in Winona didn't receive that memo. One of them unlatched the storage area doors and soon came calling the others to take a look. A pair of shoeless legs could be seen peeking from inside. It was later determined that those legs belonged to 22-year-old Kevin Casserly of Anoka County, Minnesota. Casserly had been reporting missing in November the previous year. A coroner attributed his death as the result of hypothermia. But how he ended up shoved into the front end of a rental RV remains a mystery. The discovery of his body and the police questioning that ensued put a huge damper on trainers' party plans. On the bright side, he, his friends, and the owner of the vehicle were all cleared of suspicion in Casserly's passing. Whether their unsightly pre-wedding find boded ill for his marriage, however, is unknown. 3. The wedding surplus in December 2010, mere days before Christmas, 29-year-old Ruggiero de Massena and 25-year-old Renata Cauejo capped off a three-year courtship with an extravagant wedding in Camarage of Brazil. In December 2010, mere days before Christmas, 29-year-old Ruggiero de Massena and 25-year-old Renata Cauejo capped off a three-year courtship with an extravagant wedding in Camarage of Brazil, they declared their undying love to each other in front of 200 attendees and partied past midnight. By 2.30 a.m. on December 19, the celebration was wrapping up and guests prepared to say their goodbyes. But the groom had a surprise to share. After hugging his father and proclaiming his happiness, Damasana took his blushing bride into his arms, kissed her, and fired a single bullet into her ear. Damasana's bloodied bride sank to the floor, fatally wounded. The groom then addressed his wedding guests, many of them his own friends and co-workers, with the aid of his 380 revolver. Bullets whizzed past faces and grazed flesh. Damasana unloaded multiple rounds into the head of his best man, killing him. The frenzied gunfire continued until Damasana finally turned his gun on himself. He later died at a local hospital. Many who knew the groom were stunned. Employees at the motorbike importation company where Damasana worked portrayed him as a diligent and all-around happy guy. Even on his wedding day, he wore a perfect poker face, betraying no discontentment before his homicidal outburst. But those related to the bride saw things differently. According to Renata Kawaiho's brother, Damasana had a tendency to fly into jealous rages that could get physical. One of Renata's former university classmates remarked that he had a horrible temper. Those seeking to make sense of the senseless carnage speculate that Damasana at least suspected that Kawaiho had been cheating with his best man. 
Whatever the impetus, his crime left hideous emotional scars where beautiful memories should have been. To the newlyweds. June 9, 2008, was a monumental day for Barry Johnson and Wendy Showbrook. On that day, the UK couple said I do before friends and family, promising that nothing short of death would separate them. Not 24 hours after exchanging vows, they perpetrated a savage murder. The newlyweds wedding reception was the first inauspicious sign of things to come. Showbrook felt ignored by her new hubby and lashed out by lavishing attention on father of four and possible paramour George Ouchterlone. A neighbor would later claim that, after returning home from the ceremony, Johnson verbally chastised his wife for sleeping with Ouchterlone. Hostilities only intensified after a night of debauchery. Arguing drove an alcoholically aggressive Showbrook to set their bed on fire with Johnson in it. She then stormed off to Ouchterlone's place for the night. The next day, Johnson and his wife talked on the phone. It's alleged that Showbrook falsely accused George of raping and robbing her. Incensed, Barry stormed over to Ouchterlone's house, where Wendy let him in. The pair then pulverized Ouchterlone with an assortment of weapons that included an oar, a rope, and a glass tumbler. Over that torturous stretch of time, the victim sustained 38 injuries, some of which resulted in brain damage. He died within hours. Ouchterlone's body was found several days later on Friday the 13th. His assailants were soon arrested. Barry, despite having bragged to friends about the attack, professed his innocence. Wendy only copped a drunk in pyromania, later admitting that she rushed to George's house to punish her husband. She denied instigating the murder. Both, however, were convicted of it. Barry Johnson and his wife were sentenced to 12 and 5 years in prison respectively. Won a night out with friends. In November 2014, Sir Yemen and Matthew Williams met at a bar in South Wales during a night of drinking with friends, a friendly night at the local watering hole soon evolved into plans for a cozier interaction. Williams coaxed the 22-year-old Yam into dropping by the bed and breakfast where he had been staying. She agreed, no doubt expecting a pleasant evening with a new friend. But less than a day after meeting each other for the first time, Surrey's Yam and Matthew Williams were dead. B. This was prohibited at the facility, which was designed for the homeless. She abandoned gift wrapping to go lay down the law. After forcing her way into the room, she found Williams looming over Yem's lifeless body, blood pooling about her. What Miles didn't realize at the time was that Williams had devoured chunks of Yem's face and one of her eyes. Officers were called to the scene and tried to subdue Williams with a 50,000 volt taser. The jolt of the stun gun proved lethal for Williams, who died moments after being detained. In the aftermath, it was revealed that Yam died of traumatic injuries caused by a sharp object, possibly a knife. Her killer you'll be unsurprised to discover probably should have been in a psychiatric ward. Williams was a violent ex-con who suffered from paranoid schizophrenia and was prone to drug abuse. At the time of his attack, he was fresh out of prison. His mother attested that he regularly hallucinated, while a friend of Williams alleged that he was hopped up on a bevy of drugs the day he met Yam. 
whatever sinister delusion or uncontrolled rage specifically prompted Williams to kill and cannibalize his victim, however, will remain a mystery.